<laughs> so like I've seen shit going around, so it should be interesting. Uh, but look, we're gonna get this jumping off. Um, I'm gonna start like this, um, just to kind of set the tone, set the vibe for everybody here. Um, this is not this is not the, the the place where we're gonna be calling anybody out. We're not trying to put anybody on blast. We're not trying to take shots. That's not what this conversation is about. This is about coming together and have a very real fucking conversation about shit that is extremely important, right? Accountability. Um, I can't stress how important that is, but before we actually get there, I just want to say to everybody that's actually watching right now, this is a safe space, okay? So if, for the people that are talking shit, please peace the fuck out. I have no time for that. Um, and, and, and now what I want to do is, is talk really... <laughs> Don't, don't worry, my man. Like, as you can see, the number's popping up. My, like, one of the things I'm most proud of on earth is my community is so predicated on building up, no tearing down, you know, yep. just like yep. thoughtfulness, accountability is like something I'm all about. Um, so, you know, I'm writing a new book and accountability is a huge theme. So... I think it's a tremendous that, call out from your standpoint, but seeing the numbers coming in right now, like I just know the DNA of a lot of those, you know, individuals. And I, I feel like it's going to be, listen, conversations around accountability, you know, our advertising space actually, well, I think, you know, with so many, excuse me, with so many people on here, predominantly from my notification, yeah. I actually, one of the most exciting things for me is a yep. lot of people don't know a lot about the advertising industry. And I wanted to give you a few minutes before yep. we get into what got us here and you'll set that up. I'd love, I want to make sure as, as well, you get a few minutes to kind of give everybody a little awareness on you because. That, Absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, just so that, anyway, everybody knows who I am. So my name is Walkier. I am an executive creative director at VML YNR. So I've been in this space for about 21 long ass fucking years. How long, how many years have you been in advertising, man? This is 21 for me. I started VaynerMedia with okay. AJ in May of 2009. Okay. 12 years, right. So I think you did kind of 12. decent in your 12. <laughs> but yeah. I... <laughs> that's, another, that's another live for another day of like yeah, yeah. my point of view of like the consumer centricness of like how I think about it. Nice, but nice. So yeah. Yes, it's, been a, it's been a decent run for sure. Innovation companies like uh, New York Times, uh, you know, uh, Viacom, Google, it was part of the executive leadership team that sold MySpace to Justin Timberlake and Specific Media. That is me, ECD now, VML, YNR. I am the guy that invented a ton of fucking advertising solutions. So shit like sequential messaging, which is those ads that follow you around, I, I invented and patent. For anybody who's on, this is just a much better <laughs> yeah, looking right. Don Draper if uh, you want context. And dude, by the way, on that, on that note, I okay. literally started watching Mad Men during COVID because I never watched it because I knew I didn't know enough about the, like I knew that if I saved it, yep, I yep. would know a lot more of like yep. the ad world because I came from a different angle. Uh -huh. And I'm glad I waited because I'm enjoying it. I'm in season four right now and I'm enjoying it because if I watched it when it was airing, I was too outside yeah. and didn't know well, a lot of the you, stuff I know now and it's, it it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get it. But uh, I, get it. I, I hear, I, get it. I hear. So yeah, that's, well that's a little bit about me. Let's get into this a little bit. Um, first, I'm going to set the vibe with like just letting people yep. know why we're even having this conversation. So um, last summer, Gary and I did yep. a, a panel on allyship in action. Uh, in that discussion, I had asked him and two other uh, CEOs um, what they planned on doing to create a space like uh, for black people in the C-suite. At the time, Gary had said, great. We're, you know, putting everything on my shoulders. I'm not within a holding agency. So I'm going to be pulling in two black C-suites by Jan 1 or Q1. So about two weeks ago, I took that video clip, posted it online, not being a dick, not trying to call Kerry out, but saying, hey, yo, my man, look, you said this. This is great. I praised him in that. I said, look, you know, other executives should be doing this shit. Where are you at? Where did you get? Gary then responded on Twitter by way of via, via a uh, video post. We ended up going to the DMs and said, let's actually have this conversation publicly because, again, it, this is the type of shit that needs to happen. So but before we get into that, you, you touched on it a little bit earlier. I'm just curious to know, like, what is your thoughts on, you know, accountability? Like, what does accountability mean to you? It means the most, right? To your point, whether it's around anything, anything, you know, me too, 
you know, black executives in a company like the thing we had. Um, silly stuff like I'm gonna invest in NFTs or I'm gonna do that, you know, if you don't deliver on it, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna lose reputation. You know, a lot of people talk about personal brand or all this stuff these days. It's all just reputations. The same stuff in the 1800s. You know, there was, a, or chiefs and Indians or cavemen. Like if you couldn't, if you can't stand behind your word, you're, if you're just saying things optically of the moment, and that's really, I think, what the crux of the moment is. I think if you look back at the last 20 years, things pop off could be anything. I think, you know, I think I've been doing a lot of homework mm -hmm. on why kidnapping scared parents in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I get into these weird holes of like curiosity around human psychology. Like, you know, everybody comes out, video games, rap music, like all the stuff we grew up with through the years of like, you know, if you don't, if you don't back up your words in public domain, you lose the trust of people, whether it's people internally, whether it's people externally. It's, you know, it's something I think everybody has to think about and i think if you're not backing up your so, word what are you right? let's kind of kick it into to fast forward a little bit uh and touch on the question because why i did that post because i was trying to was because i want to ask the question where have you to this point actually landed with those two hires so since uh what do you think that was? about that, think that yeah. was july or august that was when they, we had sense? that big ass fucking storm i think it was july yeah july or august yeah you remember that? Yeah, so we, you know, it's been interesting. First, in, in okay. since July and August, so the answer is one out of the two. And I remember at the time of that, I was happy I said January 1st or Q1 because I knew there was multiple things going on. We'd lost some pretty significant business. We were letting go of some people. And I remember thinking, fuck, I don't have a C-suite spot besides chief diversity, which I think is like, you know, we've talked yep. about this in the past, like that's not gonna get it done. So okay. it's kind of okay. cool. So the answer is one, chief diversity, you know, but what's better, and that's the word I'll use, is there are two positions I've created, um, which I'd be more comfortable, the only reason I'm, kind of holding back is it would leapfrog people that hold SVP roles right now. Gotcha. And I don't want to put them on blast because I haven't talked to them, but, but we've been interviewing one and the winning candidate amongst my team is this incredible woman who blew me away. And I told the team a month ago, I'm like, I'm not hiring yep. her. And this goes back to accountability, right? Like, you know, so for example, we've had two creative director yep. roles since June 1st come up at Vayner um, that have yep. been filled by black employees. That is because I wouldn't sign off on the candidates okay. that they put in front of me that weren't. The way I feel like I can control it at this point is because I have to sign off on every hire. And so for me, I can't control the growth or not growth of our business. I can, I can decline it. I basically Good. created Good. two C-suite roles that don't exist. Because to me, it's like, look, yeah. we'll run on less margin. Yeah. These are gonna be expensive salaries because they're C-suite. Yeah. Maybe they're premature because we're a small company, but it allows me to deliver on what is important to me because for me, if you can't, it's kind of like anything, right? Like my dad loves mm -hmm. Hank Greenberg. He was a Jewish baseball player. I'm like, Dad, why do you like him? He's a Jew. I go, cool. He was able to see that person. Mm -hmm. If you can't see the person, you can't feel it, right? So for me, I've, you know, we've hired one. Okay. I've offered two. So in October, November for the, two, I've actually created three. Okay. I'm going to shoot it pretty straight here. There's actually four spots in play now because there's okay. some things I'm okay. thinking about, not to scare current employees if you're watching this. Um, there's two I've created. There's three, chief diversity I filled. Um, and then there's two others I've created. I've made offers to one individual on one, two individuals on the other. I haven't been able to oh, land yeah. them because I was trying to steal them from big time gotcha. places. And we're still a little bit of a small company. Um, so that's where we're at. I have a pretty substantial read mm -hmm. on 
another role that I feel great about. My intuition back to accountability, so the answer's one, to like be in its most forefront. I think, okay. I think by June 1st, I'm at three. Um, the other things that have happened is two of the three creative directors, uh, two, excuse me, two of two have been black since, we've, since June 1st. 22% um, of our hires since uh, June 1st at all levels have been black. Um, I've been really holding a quota. You know, it's funny. Mm -hmm. I've been so anti-quota my whole life. But if you don't hold, it's kind of, yeah. I've, I've decided not to consider a quota anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of it like, it's kind of like a PL. I don't think, I don't think paying my salaries is a quota. It's something yeah. that I just need to do to keep the machine breathing. And so, okay. um, okay. that's, and that's good. And, and back to your point, like I will to say question. too, there's, I think the go-to position for a lot of black people usually is a black woman at a chief diversity officer spot. And not to say that it's, I don't want to discount that by any means. I know I have very good friends in that role, but I think to some extent the role is bullshit because I feel that they're set up to lose, right? And they're set up to lose because two things happen. Number one is they're not reporting directly to the CEO, right? Number two is they have no budget. A lot of the times, yes, there are some that don't report directly to the true? CEO. Yeah, so... That that to that to me was um, to me a C suite exactly. person needs exactly, to be exactly right. Going or sometimes they sit the within human resources. And the other people, pe they have no fucking team, right? So so it's like this one person is set up to fucking come in here and make the make change when in when actuality that like I say too, it's like every person across the company in the C suite leadership should be accountable for diversity and the numbers. Right. And this is why I always say, too, is like 100%. we should be putting that or baking that into their bonuses. Right. Because let's be honest, like you and I both know. Right. A C-suite like you're let's just call it like on the low end, north of five hundred thousand dollars salary. Right. And then let's just say your your bonus is fifty hundred percent. Right. Let's just call it 100 percent for someone on the high end of that. Of that 100 percent, I say that 20 percent, 25 percent of that should be based on your diversity numbers throughout your organization. And I think when you see stuff like that happen, when it affects people's bottom line pockets, that's when we see a, a drastic amount of change. You can make anybody do anything. You know, we've never had bonuses. We've always, I've always been scared that bonuses yep. would lead to debate and unhappiness. I've now gone the other way on that. Um, I'm, I'm now doing that. And to your point, you can make anybody do anything you want if they're bonus, if a decision maker, if you say you have to collect baseball cards and that's 25% uh, yeah, of your bonus, basically. they're gonna have some Kobe rookies in their collection. So I agree with you. I think for every seat, you know, listen, every, this is, everybody gets to do whatever they want in life, like at some level. To me, if you want to make that a priority in your organization, for me, it's more around just the value that it brings to the table. One of the things I'm doing in parallel is, I'm kicking off a meeting with my senior mm. team this week around age. So one thing I've been thinking a lot about is 60, 70, 80 year old employees. I've been, and I've been talking about it for years and I've just been talking and I'm like, you know what? Like, fuck it. With COVID, I've been so much more operational. I've been able to get a lot of things done that I want to. I'm gonna get this one done too. And so if I want 60 year olds in my company, 70 year olds in my company, because I think the creative industry yep. is incredibly age-ismed out. Um, so to your point, I think if you make it part of All someone's right. bonus, so let me ask a question. That nature, you're gonna get I've it I've heard from, from a handful of leaders that this fear of, well, I can't make room at my table because I've been running this agency or this company for years with my best friends. We went to college together. Our kids know each other. And so there's like this very much like this old boys network and white privilege, right? So how do you as a leader change the way, you know, that way of thought? I mean, you know, again, I, yeah. I, here's what I would say if this was one of my friends saying that. Look, you get to do whatever you need. You get to live life, right? You live life. I think this is an incredible mistake to use that as an excuse, you know, because I, don't, I just don't think it's going to be the kind of thing that is going to be historically correct, nor is good for your organization, because I think difference of thought in general, if that was all black executives, all women, all age, like 
the narrowness of the eco chamber of that thought yeah. cr creates a lack of opportunity. You know, that, that's where I would go with that. You know, I think one of the things back to the way we started this, you're like, it's been a good run. I think one of the reasons Vayner has been a good run is yeah. we didn't know anything. You know, it was the creative thought of doing it differently. So I think, well, from my standpoint, I would tell my friend in that scenario, I don't think yeah. that that's but do you, I mean, an incredibly good You can be strategy. as candid as you, as you like on this question, but I mean, have you heard similar stuff from other CCs? Because really? I, I feel like I've heard it a few times being told to me, and it's, it's as if there's a, a fear. There's legitimate fear of feeling like I, I'm going to lose something now. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, I'll be very candorous. I don't think I've talked okay. to a CEO okay. well, of an ad agency well, this year. Well, even other C-suites and other I mean, companies, I'm talking 2020. Companies, I'm, right? You know, yeah, other, you know, the problem, not the problem, this is a, actually, it's a slang term. The incredible thing is most of the CEOs I know are incredibly progressive. You know, I come more from, I, I'm a little out of the loop in the wine world, which is not progressive, but most of my relationships sit in incredibly progressive Silicon Valley DNA places. And look, and they, yeah, Silicon Valley and DC yeah, life has of plenty of its own shortcomings. Uh, but the ones I've talked to, and I think this is product of selection of who you decide to have relationships with, I think have been more thoughtful than that. I have not heard of anybody going that route. I do think, I do think that the ad world is very traditional in its, and it's thinking about the product and it's thinking in second. I think I got that. I got that. No worries. I I feel yeah. like the like I feel like a lot of big companies are more focused on the optic win oh, absolutely. Absolutely. than they are of actually believing it. Like for me for me, I just wanna win and you know, whatever is not as good as I think it can be, whether that's diversity and leadership. Yep, yep. Yep, you good, you good. So for me, I just think it's like, do the right thing, always be accountable. If something's not where you want it to be, like black leadership in my company wasn't where it needed to be and I need to address it. And you take full accountability and you start. I appreciate that. And I think that a lot of people it's your, want to hear it's your that, company. right? It goes back to the conversation we were having is like, you know, we saw so many companies post the black square, right? Black lives matter and all this shit and stand on their soapbox and say, we're going to donate millions of dollars. Right. But in actuality, like seven, eight months and nine months later, no one's saying a fucking word. It's like nothing happened. So I think what now we're seeing, people want answers, right? It's like, what the fuck is Maybe. going on, you know? I think people have choices too. Like, I think like, yes. And I think people will, you know, I watch every day. All I do for a living really will is, to, I'm really yeah. a strategist. I've come to real, now in, talking in our world, yeah. I just listen and watch and listen and watch and, you know, there's a million, there's a million different ways that people decide to play it. My big thing is that you're like, everyone's gonna, the, the, the consumer is the consumer is the consumer. So like, for example, let me go the reverse on you. One thing I'm fascinated by is the, re so I did something recently where I was looking at things that were canceled yeah. and how their business was. And keyboard warriorship goes both ways. You know, keyboard advocacy, that's not backed up by action, right? I mean, I literally, for example, I looked at people canceling Chick-fil-A. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh just, yeah. Just search it on Twitter, go type it in. And then literally, literally watch people yeah, four months later, it. post a photo on their Instagram eating it. So I think, I think both sides are quite vulnerable to this hypocrisy bullshit thing. Leaders who come out and try to act cool in the moment and then disappear six cents months later, what you're talking about, and then I think the reason they get away with it is because people say things, but then don't act on it either. My, my favorite example of this mm -hmm. is during the last four presidential elections. I have friends on both sides of the aisle, like most people. And going back to Bush 
and then Obama, and then Trump, and like everyone's moving wow. to Canada. No shit. I've had 80 wow. friends move into Canada yeah. on both sides. Nobody fucking moved to Canada. And I think that's the extreme, but to your point, you know, my bigger question, I was talking to a friend the other day who's going through a tough situation on this where the CEO made claims yep. and she's nowhere close to anywhere, right? And I finally said to her after about 30 minute phone call, cause she was distraught. Mm. I was like, look, you can leave. And I was like, you're so talented. That's a devastating blow to that company. But people, you know, but it's hard when you, it's hard, yes. you know, when people have mortgages yeah. and different stuff. And, this stuff is complicated and, and like, yeah. you know, and I always yep, say yep. that with compassion. I, that. I don't say it like so glib because I, you know, cause I, these are friends, these are people I care about. I'm like, look, don't leave tomorrow. Yep. Like, but interview, like get a better, get a job for 20 K more. You know, I was like, look, this is a time where people are far more open. And so, you know, you, you know, what I want is for organizations that quote unquote, don't get to where they need to get to, they they're going to feel the market Absolutely. dynamics yeah. over time. I really Absolutely. believe that. So let me ask you a question. I really then. believe that. You know, you have, it seems, it seems you have like these four positions, right? You're hoping to get some in, in by Jan or June 1. Um, what do all of your companies look like in the short, short term? Let's call it like one to two years, right? If we start to talk about diversity and inclusiveness, like what does that, what do you think or want it to look like? It's funny. It's a really interesting question. I, you know, <laughs> I, ha I think it's more around intent. And one of the, re you know, it's funny. One of the things that's so interesting about a chief diversity officer and a CEO relationship, when I was interviewing and we had about four serious candidates mm -hmm. yep. call in Q3 and four, right? Um, I, I really wanna, I'm a very big um, non-micromanager. So, you know, this incoming CDO, she'll have a lot to quote unquote say about it. For me, it's, getting into a place where we are very intent based on making sure that we have a lot of thought from a lot of different people in strategy, creative, every parts, like all parts of life, transgen, Middle East, so you're like really being and, thoughtful. And disabilities old, as well. You know, I, I use yep. the whole probably, you know, might be a word. You know, yep. it, some of these things could be yep. really interesting. I actually think it's pretty cool. Um, as far as numbers, you know, I haven't, I, I haven't set that. What I, what I, what I don't know yet is, do I want to set that? And, and by the way, that's why I think much like my CFO, yep. I'm very passive to like listening and then say, no, yes, no, yes. I think that's something that I'm looking for in value from a CDO, but I'm not against, tr you know, to be honest with you, I'm not against trying a lot of things. I'm not against having a year where we look at the end of the, you know, I don't know if, if, for example, let's role play. If at the end of October this year, I have a significant meeting on DNI and the CDO is like, look, next year I wanna hit these numbers. That doesn't scare me because I don't think one year is like the end all be all stamp of life. Yep. I'm like, let's try it. Let's see what it feels like, right? Um, you know, I, I think the, the biggest thing yep. is taking things from the subconscious to the conscious. I think to me, what I hope this chapter is for a lot of people is it's the generation where this issue becomes as important as winning awards for places like that you, like for VaynerMedia, awards are demonized. Yep. For your career, awards are on a pedestal. For both of our companies, yep. paying your bills and having a CFO is a requirement. And I, to me, I think that DNI is going to become a requirement for successful progressive businesses. That's my biggest ambition, yeah. that I never get lulled, lulled. Like that I, I know what I said to myself when I was brushing the teeth and it was, forget about the people watching this mm -hmm. or the clips, like me with myself brushing my teeth. And I said, I'm never not gonna pay attention. Yeah. Right, like to me, as long as I'm in control, I can pay, like it now runs through my head. Like, by the way, you notice how I yep, yep. interestingly said, well, now there's four roles. When things transact in my mind of like, is this the right person for this role? No, they're not. It now becomes top of mind for me of like, where do I sit? Yeah. Whereas before it wasn't yeah. enough. Yeah. And, look, and that's I accountability, that. I right? Think we all appreciate that. But let me ask another question then. Because the other question then falls down on, sure. well, okay, well, we'd love to put in that talent, but we can't find them. 
So, so I mean, so how are you? I'm. How are you? That's bullshit. Honestly, that one you're. That one you're not gonna get. That's fucking bullshit. I. I, I have a guy who does analytics for uh, a lot of script doing for me, like scaling me. And I said, look, there's this role that I have in mind. And I said, go to LinkedIn and show me. He showed me 25 candidates in one fucking day. That, listen, people, people right now watching are not losing weight and working out because they're claiming that they have too much work and their kids are around too much. Well, you know that's an excuse. Yep. By the way, the other thing for the ad world, and we're going very narrow here, I do think the ad world lacks in D and I compared to other well, ones. So here's the problem. So go though. and take it's people from it, publishing. A lot of agencies think that they can only find talent within other agencies, which is why which is why the tech world wins a lot. That's stupid. Because they fucking go out and diversify. They pull people from everywhere. You know what? Well, you know what? For me, publishing is loaded. There's, you know, publishing is so niche that there's incredible. That's what I have been talking to my team about. I'm like, look, yeah. there's yep. publications that have ninety percent of the work staff being black. And they have creative directors. And by the way, when you look carefully, yeah. their first four years out of school were at McGarry Bowen. They just happened to be at XYZ yeah. for the last nine years. That one, that one is, that one's unacceptable because it's yeah. almost like <laughs> so super cliche. So then let me ask this then. Um, do you think that they're, from what you know, right? Because I'm sure you know a lot more C-suits than I do, right? what do you think, or do you think there are any companies out there that truly are a good model for what diversity should look like? Like, do you think there's anyone out there? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure. Um, I think that the best ones are the ones that are Yep. I said, the ones that I think are probably best is, you know, the ones who are in full control, who have good, you know, good control and have good intent around the subject matter. For me, I'm uncomfortably confident that when you and I do our do year it. in recap All of right, this, yep. I'm making it right now, why not, right? When we're here on December 1st, where I have a ton of data, it's gonna be executed. You know, it's just, and I'm sure, by the way, I don't think I'm, special or not special. I'm sure there's thousands of CEOs where she or he like really cares about this issue. Absolutely. But I think the, the and why we're having it. this conversation here is, is two things, right? And this is the two key takeaways I want like all 1,209 people here to fucking listen in and, and tune in on is that people like myself need to know that it is okay to actually reach out and have these conversations. It's okay to actually hold people accountable. There's this fear of saying, well, I can't say this because of this or because of that. And I want others see any C-suites that are actually watching this to know as well, that it's okay to fucking come forward and have these conversations. It's okay to say, you know what? We didn't get it all right, but it is a work in progress, right? So I do want to say, I appreciate you, you, you being candid and open here. In the, in, the, in the most serious way, like it's, you know, everyone's running, like when this all, when we were together, yeah. I'm worried about not firing more people. I'm also, I also have a whole company that's pressuring me because we didn't do raises in October to give them raises in January. I had hundreds of people. I was scared to do it. I did it. Like we have, yeah. we have everybody has lots of decisions to make. Yeah. There's a lot going on in real life. Everybody's got many things going on. My big hope is that having a diverse workforce and most important leadership team just becomes another thing that you care about. Because I think it will be, by the way, for no other reason than I think it's gonna be good for your business. Like, yes, do I think it's the right, yes, but guess what? I don't get to, for, like, I, you know, I come from the Soviet Union, like, I'm giving you my opinion. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna shit on your face if you're like, but what I'm gonna tell you is, as somebody who's passionate about stuff, it's just gonna be good. That, you know, that best friend crew and it's gonna fuck, why would that fuck you up? Like, I, like some shit doesn't work in my brain. Like literally the only thing I would, when I heard you say that, I'm like, yeah, because yeah. they're uncomfortable to have a black person in their circle. Yeah, like, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. To, to, me the, to me, the big one is what we're going through, <clears throat> which is we're deciding to make less profit, which affects all of our employees to create more spots because I didn't want to fire somebody who didn't need to be fired so I could replace them 
with a black leader in place. I said to myself, what I need to do is create new spots for these, for these leaders. And if unfortunately some other leaders don't perform when I am hiring for it, I need to prioritize the thoughtfulness around using the, you know, yep. the two creative directors we hired. We were underwater freelancing, losing money. CD, you know, our CCO's yep. concerned yep. about like client stability. You know this better than I do. And I just said to her, Angelique and Claire, like incredible people. I was like, mm -hmm. no, no. That I think for every leader who's listening needs to understand. It's one thing when it's convenient. It's another thing when it hurts. L again, for ad people, I'm gonna make it very simple. We had CDO spots open up in the summer and fall and winter. We needed those spots filled because clients were actively, we were freelancing, which is very expensive, not permanent. And we had candidates that my leadership team wanted me to hire and I said no. Because I wanted them filled with black creative directors. It's not super complicated. So I, wish, I wish more I, I wish more people could act like that. And I think I, I think, think we that, need that. I think I think that that's the only way you can win. You have to make it a priority. No different than when you say no to somebody. I said something to a friend, it kind of broke through to him. I you always bring it well to business. I said, bro. You know, sometimes somebody comes to you and says, I want a $50,000 raise and you say no, because you just can't afford it or, or, and I'm talking real now, or you just want to make more money that year and you don't want to like share, like, you know, I'm like, it's that. When it, that becomes that much of a prior, I think it's super important. I really do. I, I really think it's a, it's a operational task that is achievable but it's as simple as making it a priority. No different, I spent, well, I spent, my, all my 30s telling my friends I was too busy to work out and eat healthy. Bullshit. I'm busier than ever and I'm fucking <laughs> looking at this shit. I'm making shit happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I prioritized it, right? I'll give you another one. I'm busy as shit right now, right? But I see this whole NFT movement. I don't know if you're yep, yep. looking at yeah, the crypto space, the blockchain. And this week I canceled two or three important meetings. Important just to do conversations with people that are ahead of me in the space to educate myself yep. because I'm prioritizing it. It doesn't look on paper to be the most convenient or even short-term transactional best use of my time, but long-term, it matters for me, NFT, I think. <laughs> and, and that's how I think about these kind of issues, which is don't do the convenient thing do the right thing for yourself. You get to decide what that right thing is for me. I agree to that completely. It's better and I appreciate that. It's uh, it's interesting, man, because you know, it's funny because a lot of people come to me and they say, "Well, you know, tell us, tell us why we see ads like you know the H and I say this a lot, the H and M with you know with the kid and the monkey on it, the black kid." And I say it's because we don't see, you know, black leaders at the table, right, having these conversations. More importantly, the C-suite creatives, right. So, and, and you'll you'll hear me bring this up a lot. It's like when I look across all five major holding agencies. For folks that are watching that don't understand, these agencies own something like 90% of creative agencies and media agencies across the world. And in the US, there are only two black chief creative officers, right? At my level underneath that, there are now six black ECDs, two of which under my, my agency. And then under that, there's about five group creative directors. So that's so that's crazy. And I and I bring that back a lot to the point that like I almost feel like that we're in a time like the NFL was in the 80s, right? 70s and 80s, where you rarely saw a black quarterback, right? And a, a creative officer, a creative director is essentially So they are like they are like in the you're hall calling back, plays, buddy. you know, and in, in, in throwing the passes, right? And, and selling through and pitching through all that shit. Um, and back then it was like, you know, they didn't trust them. They didn't think they were smart enough. But then when they started putting them in the positions to win, they put Cunningham and fucking like all these people changed the fucking landscape of what the game could be. And I almost feel like we are in like right ahead of that. 
It's like creating these opportunities to show because if we look at like, you know, who's buying all these fucking products, it's, it's people of color, right? It's, it's... Well, it goes, you know, listen, I mean, I also think the, if you look at popular culture as a whole in America, it's incredibly yep. Yep. influenced by diverse groups. You know, and I think, yeah, I mean, look, this is, this is a foregone conclusion. And then I tell a lot of my black friends, I'm like, like, yeah, yeah. you know, start your own shit. <laughs> like, let me, play, let me help you. Like, you know, like, it's so sometimes hard. Like, it was how I was as a student. Everybody yeah. thought you had to be a good student, you know, like, and I was like, I was a bad student. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to do my own kind of weird shit. I think, I think yep. sometimes it takes breaking the game altogether. And I think, you know, I think you'll continue to see that evolution. I really hope so. And for me, it's about allocating an hour at night like this, like we're doing right now. And hopefully some leader or some kid yep. thinks a little bit different. It's about the actions. Like it all just comes down to the individual human beings, right? Your action. I actually saw another kid. I don't know if you saw the Twitter reply. I didn't really, the way I replied yeah. was to another person that got in between our convo. Like you just, you just, it's the opening and the willingness to have conversations. And I think to your point, I think you make an important point. One thing I've been talking to a lot of friends about as the world in general is dealing with a lot of issues from race and gender and financial. I'm like, look, we have to leave space for people to say, I'm sorry. And for people to say I'm yeah. in progress yeah. because that's how you get yeah. good shit yeah. done. But I mean, we can't get there unless you know? people like yourself are actually okay with having these conversations, right? More importantly, we can't get there if people like yourself don't have the passion to continue the conversation on a daily basis. For me, you know, what I thought best after a lot of the conversations yeah. I had in the summer was, was doing what I've been doing, making sure the slots as they like became available yeah. in my organization were filled by black leaders, making sure that I created the slots for even more, even if at this size of my company, maybe it was inconvenient financially, but I think it's actually convenient financially because the spirit and the energy and the vibes and the love and the feelings that come yep. associated with getting your organization proper will lead to much more happiness. People will work yeah, happier, absolutely. feel absolutely. like it matters so look, to me. I'm gonna ask you one last question and then we might, might ask a few questions here from, from, from the people that are watching. You know, you kind of talk in this a little bit, you peppered it throughout our conversation, but for any CEOs that are actually watching or get a hold of this, I'm sure some press is, is going to end up writing about this some week, sometime this week. Uh, what advice would you give for them to help diversify their organizations, to, to, to settle the fear that they might have of creating that room at the table, to express the importance of actually having, you know, a diverse group of individuals there? The, the, yep. fear, the fear at the table, I have no answer for. If you fear having a black leader or several black leaders at your table, that's a very, mm -hmm. you have to really ask yourself why. You know, to me, I think the one that's more practically, honestly, well, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what the answer to that is. Like, I don't know, like if I sat down with somebody who says fear, I would, there is yep. no proper answer to that. What, what may be more practical is, I can't afford more slots. And for me, it's like run less profitably in the short term so you can run more profitably in the long term. I mean that. And I think that will help people dope, practicalize dope. it. You know what? No. No. Does that make sense? You, you understand what I'm saying? Like to me, the first, that part breaks with my you know, brain. I, I, what are you I, it's it's of? weird, man. Like, I think it's a fear of losing control, right? It's a feel, it's a feel of, again, like, from the control? conversations I've had, which is well, making room mean at the table means I have to let one of my good buddies that I've known my whole life go, right? Instead of creating, right? That thing is. By the way, by the way, I think that's fair. That's why mm -hmm. I had to go through. That's why I said my second part: mm -hmm. run less profitable. It will be. It will be better for your business. I. I that's what, you know. I almost don't want to sit on a soapbox. I don't want to talk about social. I don't want to talk about your reputation. I don't even want to go. This, I, have, I have made more breakthroughs with my friends on these conversations. By the way, you know this. Yeah. This was a yeah. conversation yeah. every well, day four years ago with Me Too, every day. And I said, listen to me. I was like, listen to me. And by the way, there's gonna be three to four more in everyone's career. Yeah. Right? You know, like, this is good. 
this is good. This is great. And, and the answer is yeah. be less profitable. And you know what happens, right? When you're, when you're, when you're, yeah. when you're somebody who loves you says that to you in a good way, you know what you really do? You start looking at other things. Yeah. Right? All of a sudden, you don't need to buy 40 cupcakes. Or, you know, Will, do you understand that if all the big six holding companies would stop buying too much bagels and orange juice for every pitch meeting that nobody eats anyway mm. and cut that in half, Millions. they would have plenty of room for another Millions. black leader yeah, no, that's real at talk. the table. That's real financial. Talk. You, know, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Well, dude, man, look. Um, that, I mean, let me check. The, 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 some of the questions are crazy, man. So I'm not going to actually go here with some of these. But I will say that, look, <laughs> you, you, you like fucking marriage proposals <laughs> and shit. Jesus, man. This is what it comes to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I told right. you. I told you look, you were man, better uh, looking uh, done. Hey, look, let's. Yeah, look, these are, these are the conversations that need to be had. We're on for 45 minutes. I saw people saying, thank you so much for being on this long on this subject. People glaze over it. People... People, look, if you're a human being, you don't have to feel uncomfortable. We're all, bro, I'm working, you wanna hear something funny about me? I'll say it publicly right now. I'm working on my kind candor, on candor. Believe it or not, in these domains, I'm great at candor. Well, the reason my agency isn't as great of a culture as it should be because of my heart is because I struggle with candor and telling people they're not good at things. Yeah because I don't like negativity. Yeah, it's wild, because they're like, fuck you, Gary Vee, but the people who work for me are like, yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. Like, we're all working on shit. We're all working on shit. And like, race, candor, kindness, most people are mean in the office because they're actually insecure. I have incredible, Will, I have incredible angst with the creative industry. The way that people make the work better, but it's a completely subjective call. You know, there's so many things everyone's working on. And it's okay for race to be one of them. What's not okay is, is not being accountable. What's not okay is hiding from like a situation. It's never, it's, not, listen, by the way, you do you. I'm not telling you how to live your life. It's, when I say it's not okay, it's not gonna work yeah. out well. Yeah, you're right. It's not. You're absolutely right. Look, man, I, you know, I appreciate this. I appreciate that you actually came forward and had the conversation. I appreciate that you, you know, we had this conversation in the DMs and decided, yes, just go out and actually have this publicly. Because again, I'll say it a third time. These conversations need to be happening. And for anyone that's watching, like, it's okay to fucking ask people what's going on, right? It's okay to be vocal and say, look, you promise this, what's going on? Please. Yeah, do it. Go ahead. Can I give you one? Can I give you one? I did an all hands on meeting for like all my thousand employees. And I was like, questions? And young lady, third week in the company, she was like, she came at me super hot. I was so proud of her. Back to like, I know you're right now, I'm listening to you for these 45 minutes. I'm like, I see. It's important. Yeah. He's trying to give courage to people to yeah, ask absolutely. questions because yeah. communication solves problems. But I love you for that. So let me jump on it. Let me tell you a story of a young lady who on her third week at VaynerMedia, went on the screen in front of the whole company with me and started talking social dilemma and like, what's our responsibility? And I was proud of her. And I gave her all my answers of like, what I believe. She came like, and she didn't just like, oh, thank you, great Gary, for an answer. She came back and it was this incredibly awesome dialogue that honestly helped a lot of people. Like, you know, yeah. Netflix is an algorithm. Making you watch it, like, you know, like, like it was a thoughtful combo. And I think, I think right now, People, there's so much tilt in the air, but I think you're absolutely right. Yes, and by is. the way, there's a million ways to ask a question. There's public, there's public ways. People, listen, I'm, a, I'm out and about. I get asked publicly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I answer. Yep. Like you and me talk. So we got here tonight. I get asked privately. I try to answer. I get 20,000 of them a day, but I answer. I get emails. I get groups. Like, Either you're gonna answer or you're not. And what I can tell you from somebody who's got nowhere to hide, if you just tell people your answer, yeah. Yeah. it's a lot better you're right, than man. that. And I think that's all we want a lot of the time, right? It's, it's especially right now, um, just so many promises and people just wanna know like what is going on, right? And it's what's unfortunate is a lot of the publications aren't able to even get this story out there for whatever reason they might have. I'm not gonna go there publicly here, but that's, that's unfortunate, you know? I said, but what's unfortunate is that, that um, up, you know, so many publications uh, 
have lacked in writing up that information, right? Have lacked on like the follow through and, and I get why, and I'm not going to call them out specifically why, um, but you know, it needs to happen. Honestly, honestly, my man, fuck the publication aspect. Like to me, it's like the leaders, like why yeah, wouldn't yeah, you yes, want this yes, to be But I'm saying in terms of publications, actually helping to hold them, them accountable, right? By saying, hey guys, let's try, like what I would love to do, like the tens and twenty millions of fucking dollars are supposed to be donated to all these different organizations. I don't know where did it go? Like what happened? Right? Oh. Because they were standing everyone was standing on a soapbox and not did that it, anyone did fucking it, knows. Did it, did it happen? Exactly. Nobody's sure and nobody's right? really accountable. Exactly. So, so like and, and, and the thing is you, we had executives and agencies and companies were standing on their soapboxes in the in the summer, but now like everyone everything's fucking crickets, right? Mm -hmm. But again, why this conversation is important, you know? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Doing well, my man. I really well, appreciate it, uh, man. I I'm hope getting, you're doing I'm well. Getting, you're probably done for the night. I'm getting a ton of text messages and saying, yo guys, you should take this to Clubhouse. I don't know if you want to, if you're around, you can send me, a D you don't have to answer now. You can send me a DM, let me know how your night might be. Well, I, I don't, you'll appreciate this. I deemed it earlier because I have something in the do back end with Singapore. So I gotta go do my Absolutely, responsibilities. Man. But we'll I appreciate plenty you. Plenty more times. You as well, buddy. Okay. Chat soon. I hope you have a wonderful night. Take care. Bye bye. Oh, shit. Okay. Look, everybody, that was dope. I appreciate you all coming out and engaging in the conversation. I will say later this Friday, we have another dope interview going down. Um, this is actually going to be with someone who many of us have idolized, right? This brother is, is, is amazing. But we're going to be doing a conversation uh, this Friday night at 9 p.m. around uh, Black Excellence with one of my favorite boxes of all time. I'm not putting this out in case I'll put it right here. Sugar Chain Mosley, all right? It's gonna be crazy to have the, the one of the best pound for pound boxes in the world, having, a, excuse me, a full discussion on his career and what black excellence means to him. So with that being said, go ahead and give me a follow so you can actually come through and check it out. Get pinged when I go live, it's gonna be amazing. Again, thank you all. And the last thing I'll say is use your fucking voices. Get out there, let's have these uncomfortable conversations. Let's hold individuals accountable. Let's hold executives accountable, companies accountable. None of this shit happens unless we're out here making some noise. So go out and make some noise, everybody. Thank you so much.